Stand up in the fear of God and listen to the Holy Gospel. A chapter from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew the Evangelist. Apostle and pure disciple, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. As some of our teacher David, the prophet and king, may his blessings be with us all. Amen. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, O Lord, God and Savior, and the King of us all, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Glory be to you forever and ever. Amen. At that time, disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of the, these little ones who believed in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life, lame or maimed, rather than having two hands on two feet, to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Uh, Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That was a very important question on the mind of the disciples. And we see that was, very, was mentioned a number of times throughout the, the Gospels. On different occasions, at different times, this question arose they asked it directly here to our Lord Jesus Christ. On other times, they were asking among themselves while they're walking, who's the greatest? And in even in other times, this question was on the mind of not just the disciples, but even the parents of the disciples. If you remember the mother of St. John and St. James, the sons of Zebedee, she came and told our Lord Jesus Christ, I want, I have a I need a request. I've got a request from you. He said, what can I do for you? He said, I want my sons, James and John, to be one on your left-hand side, one on your right-hand side. They were talking about 
earthly glory. They know that our Lord Jesus Christ will come and have as a king, and they wanted to take places, positions in that glory. And this is very dangerous concept to be amongst the disciples, to anyone, let alone the disciples. And we see that even this question was asked at a time when it was very critical. Like one of the times our Lord Jesus Christ, when he's walking up to Jerusalem with the disciples, he was telling them he was going there, this is towards the end, the, the last week before his, his crucifixion. He was telling them, I'm going to Jerusalem now, I'm going to be arrested, tortured, crucified, and die, and rise on the third day. After he told them that, the question from them is, who's the greatest? Like, this is what you're thinking about now. I'm telling you what's happening with me. And you thinking about who's the greatest? When they're asking who's the greatest, they're not talking about the greatest as in what character makes someone great. They were talking about who's going to be greatest by name. They wanted him to list them. One, two, three, four. He wanted them to allocate their positions for them. This is... The problem with that is our Lord Jesus Christ was trying to establish them as preachers of his gospel to the whole world, not as leadership position, because that's different from the world. And this is what we need to know. We are programmed that leaders, that what we see them in the world. When someone has a hierarchy in the church, they do the things in the way that the leaders in the world do. And this was corrected by our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read something uh, with you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in, in a different um, chapter, actually chapter 20 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, so a few chapters later, our Lord Jesus Christ wanted to correct that um, idea in the disciples' mind about leadership and what should it look like from a Christian perspective. And this is what he told them. This is in Matthew Chapter 20 from verse 25. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. But Jesus called them, the disciples, to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. This is what the leaders of the world do. Yet it shall not be so among you. So we shouldn't follow that. This is not the leadership hierarchy of the world. The church does not do that. But whoever desires to become great among you, so you want to be great? That's what they're asking. Who's the greatest? This is the answer. Let him be your servant. Wow, this is extreme. This is the opposite. If you want to be great, you have to be servant. If you have to be great, he went on. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Let him be a slave. So he said a servant and a slave. This is greatness in the Christian view. This is, this is, this is Christianity. When our Lord Jesus Christ turned every concept upside down, turned every concept on its head, people had this mentality, this idea about what leadership should look like. He said, no, this is the proper leadership. If you want to be greatest in heaven, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. Because he said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So he's not talking theory. He's saying, this is the way it should be. And what's, what's the proof? What's the evidence? He himself, he himself did not come to be served. He didn't come and sit down and people came to him and served him and brought him stuff and gave him gifts and gave him money. And they served him. No, he came. He was going around serving everyone. He was going around healing the sick, feeding the people, teaching them. He had no place to rest his head. He lived a very poor life. And he is the master. He is the great. And they even told him. Later on, we see our Lord Jesus Christ tried to teach him the true meaning of leadership, the true meaning of being great. You want to be great, do this. Later on, on Covenant Thursday, he said, what did he do? Teach him another practical lesson. He went down and washed the feet of the disciples. He washed their feet. 
And after he finished, he told him this. He told him, see, you called me master and teacher, which is right. And I've washed your feet. That means you should wash each other's feet. This is greatness in Christianity. This is the true meaning of greatness. And we know that while he was washing their feet, he knew that a few hours later, Judas is going to betray him. He knew a few hours later, Peter is going to deny him. And he still washed their feet. He still washed their feet. He could have said, no, you don't deserve that. You're going to deny me later. On the same night. On the same night. But he's teaching us to be humble and to actually be great by being servants and by actually going down and washing each other's feet. This is so crucial. Because what happens in the church is people, for example, who in a service or a deacon or any service in the church, they get really upset if they feel they don't get the title or the position they, they were after. It's not about titles. It's not about positions. If you want to be greatest, you go down and wash people's feet. This is the truth. This is the advice that was given to me personally when I was made superintendent of Sunday school in primary uh, many years ago. The superintendent of all Sunday school told me this. I'll never forget that advice. He told me today, don't think you're promoted because you're superintendent of Sunday school. That's not a promotion. Now you go down and wash the feet of the servants. This is your role. You wash their feet. This is their leader in the Christian view, to go down and wash their feet. If Jesus himself did that, who am I to say, no, no, that's not for me. I want my title. I want my position. And, you know, it's not fair. I deserve to be. Unfortunately, we love titles. We love a lot of titles before our names. We spend our years trying to accumulate titles so we can put letters and titles before our names so we can feel great. But this is not greatness in God's eyes. This is greatness in God's eyes. And this is the key to entering heaven. That's what he said here. This is the key. If you don't be humble as these little children, these little children, you don't call a child with a title before their name. You call them by their first name. You don't give them any titles. They don't, they're not after titles. They don't even understand what titles mean. They're very simple. They're not after great positions. They're not after all this glory. But we do. Unfortunately, we do. And this, we let this creep into the church, which is not right. Because if we do that, then instead of taking the church out to the world and teaching them the right way of doing things and how to be humble and how to be great, we do the opposite. We bring the wrong things from the world inside the church and try to put this inside the church. And if we say, no, that's not right, people get upset. That's not the way it ought to be. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ said, he said, this is what's in the world, but this is not what ought to be. Many people are very happy to follow Christ in his glory. Very happy to follow Christ in his glory. Why? Because they're going to get a share of that glory. Many people followed him when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as a conquering king. And the city was shaking from the amount of people. And the shouting, they were saying, Hosanna. And everyone followed him. Even the first in the scribe said, look, the whole world is following him. What are we going to do about it? They felt threatened. Why? Because he was entering as a king in his glory. Everyone's happy to follow someone in his glory. But a few days later, how many people actually followed him to the cross? How many people followed him to the cross? Why is that? Because now he's going to his suffering. No one wants to follow someone who's going to suffer. But we're happy to follow someone in his glory. This is not the way. And our Lord Jesus Christ, if he said, if you want to be glorified with him, we need to be suffer, to suffer with him. When we suffer with him, we're going to be glorified with him. When we go to him to the cross, we're going to go to the him and see the resurrected, the resurrection and the empty tomb. When we follow Christ, we shouldn't be selective on when to follow him and when to stop following him. But we follow him because we love him in whatever circumstance. This is very important. Uh, St. Paul said, it has not been granted for us just to 
be with him, but to actually suffer for him. Not just to love him, but to suffer for him. To suffer with Christ. This is very important. This is the time when we know truly whether we are true followers of Christ or not. This is the real test for us. And our Lord Jesus Christ brought a child and told him this, unless you are converted, this is a key word, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The word convert is so important because it's not something that they just do for a minute or two. When you convert something, it's completely changed. It became something new. And what he meant by that is to convert our mind, the way we look at things, the way we look at things. This is the key to heaven. Humility is the key to heaven. If you are doing everything else and we're not humble, then how can we enter heaven? I like it when you go to the, the old monasteries in Egypt and especially the old churches in the monasteries. If you notice, as you enter the old small churches in the monasteries, the doors are always very low. They're very small doors. People think, you know, were people small back then? No. The reason why they did very small doors is the only way to enter the church is you actually have to lower your head down and go like this to be able to fit and enter the door of the church. This is what's happening here. We cannot enter heaven unless we bear our heads down, we humble ourselves, we lower ourselves so we can enter. But if I enter and think I'm great and, and believe in myself and believe in, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I'm doing and of my titles, I won't be able to enter. The door is not going to be small enough to let me enter. And this is a question. This is a question. Will I be able to fit through that door? And that ties with the concept of the narrow gate. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, enter through the narrow gate. Why? What's wrong with the wide gate? What's wrong with the wide one? The wide, many people want to go through the wide because it's easy. Who wants to try to fit through something narrow? If it's something, if there's an option, of course everyone goes for the easy option. Everyone goes for the wide gate. But what does he tell us? He said, many people go through it, but that will lead to destruction. That will lead to destruction. The ending is bad. So we need to understand that for us, to enter the kingdom, we need to humble ourselves. We need to be converted as children. We need to have the qualities of children. Children are not after anything that we're after. If you sit down and think the things that we prioritize in our life, the things that we go and run after, if you ask a child, for the, to them it means nothing. It means nothing. It has no value to them. Our Lord Jesus Christ wants us to have that mentality. The mentality of the simplicity and the humbleness of little children. This is the way to enter heaven. And we need to start this in our family. We need to start this in our small groups and spread it in the bigger circles. We need to start this with our service in the church and to understand the true meaning of service. The true meaning of service, it's not about titles or positions or anything else, but to be a slave and a servant of all. Glory be to God forever.